working on an exit. So um, hopefully, that's why I was saying it's a numbers game. 700 is not enough. Because mm-hmm. out of the 700, how many of those companies would get acquired by a larger company? And so, yeah. um, and why I'm also advocating a lot on business integrity, because it starts from there. You have to really have a good foundation on transparency. Failure may be inevitable, but there are scientific values behind it. We've got to learn how to fail faster so we can learn smarter. Join me and let's uncover the hack behind failures. In these episodes, we'll get inside the minds of the successful, discuss the failures they've had in the past, and analyze what made them tick. So we all learn from it. Welcome to Set to Fail podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Indolos. Hey everybody, this is Joseph. You're listening to Set to Fail podcast, the show that aims to kind of reverse engineer some of you know the life lessons learned, the, the challenges uh, that successful people um, encountered during their uh, you know, uh, their rock bottom uh, moments in life, as well as trying to establish their own businesses, building their own teams uh, to success. And uh, today, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce a very special guest. And I've been uh, realistically trying to <laughs> schedule her for many, many years uh, and uh, trying to hound her on LinkedIn. <laughs> No. Uh, her name is <laughs> her name is Diane uh, Dugan Eustachio. So uh, Diane is the currently the international consultant for United Nations Development Program, which is uh, a democratic governance, crisis prevention and recovery, poverty reduction, environment and energy, as well as social inclusion and sustainable development, peace building, and climate organization. Apart from that, uh, she used to be uh, the executive director of Idea Space Foundation. So I believe it's uh, somehow like a, a accelerator similar to Y Combinator in the U.S., mm-hmm. where you know it's early stage science and technology startups solving um, emerging market issues in Philippines and around Southeast Asia. Um, mm-hmm. She's also, you know, handled and uh, owned numerous businesses. Uh, Diane, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Joseph. Uh, hello to everyone listening. I hope this is going to be worth your time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be here, happy to share my stories. No, nothing hidden. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm very excited, you know, to have you on the episode because I do believe, um, you know, the, the vast experience that you've had, especially, you know, dealing with startups will be really valuable for a lot of our listeners. Um, and the purpose of this uh, conversation is to create a community of shared success. It's not really mm-hmm. about dwelling about, you know, the, the past failures of people, but really, you know, trying to analyze and then flip the table, uh, try to understand uh, what are the things that could, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, could help propel uh, innovation, spark ideas, as well as, you know, um, advancements in the country. So, you know, prior to some of the questions, uh, Diane, maybe if you can help us a little bit about your background as well as, you know, some of the current businesses that you have and then you know, uh, your critical roles um, right now, like, you know, you're handling uh, to, to serve the community. Mm, okay. Well, um, yes, I'll just go by the order of where I spend most of my time now. Okay. Uh, so I wear four hats, four main hats. <laughs> wow. Yeah, four main hats. Uh, first hat is I'm 
I'm building a BPO, a business process outsourcing company focused on climate. I figured, you know, after working almost 10 years with entrepreneurs, which I still do, I felt like, what's the next thing for me, right? Mm -hmm. So what what can I do? And uh, I just wanted to focus on environment. I, I said, I want to do something in climate and do something in climate action. So uh, my business partner said, well, well, we, if we go into it, we got to do something that where we already have some level of expertise. So he has a uh, business process outsourcing company focused on uh, supporting insurance companies in the U.S. and in Australia. So we're starting from there and uh, we're trying to build uh, one that is focused on climate so oh, climate awesome. tech companies uh, who are outsourcing stuff where I want to build that. So that's my current startup. And oh, um, nice. we are, it, I, I can't call it like in the, in the truest, purest form a startup, but it is uh, starting up a company. And then um, my second role, second hat I'm wearing is uh, as a UNDP consultant, uh, I have been tasked to revise the business integrity toolkit for young entrepreneurs. So this is something that was involved in uh, several years ago, and it has been the the most downloaded knowledge tool of the UNB Bangkok. So um, we want to revise it and get it a bit more interactive, and uh, hopefully. Um, this will attract more entrepreneurs to download it or, well, we're going to shift to using a website also. So hopefully mm-hmm. it will be more accessible to young entrepreneurs and maybe, maybe not just young entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs in general. So I'm a, I'm a strong believer, I'm a great believer in establishing business integrity at the onset. Mm -hmm. Anyway, more on that. And let's go back to my hat. So that's my second hat. (laughs) My third hat, I take seriously. Um, I'm part of several technical panels of the Department of Science and Technology. And uh, we, they have several grants. So the Startup Grant Fund, um, uh, Women Helping Women Fund, um, Uh and uh, one that I have spent a lot of time recently is on the higher education uh, incubators. So the DOSD is encouraging more universities to to start incubators. So they provide a seed fund for these universities to to get themselves set up. So that's uh, that's my third hat, right? My right. fourth hat is. Uh, <laughs> selling eggs <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really simple thing but and i don't really make money out of it really it's not right. it's, it's just a little money but it's um it's really more the self-fulfillment right. Be, when my dad died and my my father is was a uh, advocate of regenerative farming, sustainable mm-hmm. agriculture, and, and, and diversity. Um, so we we had a small flock of chickens uh, when he died, and he wanted to just replenish the chickens because they were, they were old. And uh, so I'm a, you know, I'm a city girl, and I, right. so, but then I, I wanted to fulfill my dad's wish, and I learned that it's very important for us to be eating good food. So this was at the height of the pandemic. So I told my husband one day and I said, you know, maybe we should take this chicken thing more seriously. (laughs) So we have, yeah, yeah, we have a free range chicken farm. Wow. And uh, I, is it here in Manila or is it? uh... It's it's here in Luzon. It's in Batangas. It's not far away. So every week, my husband comes uh, home with with cases of eggs. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's it's fulfilling because um, 
I it it's uh, these are healthy eggs from healthy chickens. They are they have no antibiotics. They they are pasture raised, and I think this is what food should be. I think also this is how we also should compute the economics. Um, you know, people say that your chickens should be uh, at seventy percent yield and or seventy percent production, but I've I've asked many free range chicken farmers to ask them, are you at 70% production? And no, that isn't the case. So I think we just have to revise the, the economics of it. I, I think uh, free range chicken farming is probably going to, it, it's probably more costly, but then people will have to, people are willing to pay. There are people willing to pay. So I have a small, customer base who are willing to pay a little bit more for past uh, eggs, uh, chickens, I mean, eggs from pasture-raised chickens. So oh, they, that's great. Maybe maybe uh, one of these days I'll, I can you know, talk a orders. lot about chickens. <laughs> 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 they just I, like I, humans, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, uh, personally, I'm a pescatarian. And I also have an urban farming <laughs> here oh. in uh, in Tai Tai in uh, Rizal. Uh, it's a very small farm. We do hydroponics. We do, uh, you know, tilapia, and then we also do pet chai, and then also oyster mushrooms. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, I'll send you some pictures after. Yeah, <laughs> after this call. I'm a believer of community supported agriculture. I think that our food should not be sourced more than a hundred kilometers away um yes. it lowers your fo carbon footprint it also ensures that your food is fresher and you support the community around it it also contributes to food security in in times of say lockdown or let's say there's a war or any right. <laughs> any threat or let's say there there is a natural disaster at least we know where to source our food um, and we're not going to go hungry and uh, we, yeah. we know who the farmers are around us. 100%. So anyway, that, uh, those are my four hats and uh, oh. maybe the fifth hat you, I can, I can say is family. I, uh, I take care of my oh. mother and my mother-in-law, my husband, my son. And, oh, that's uh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome! That that well, hundred percent. Uh, uh, I mean, you get you're living the life, um, and I I do believe you also provide a lot of value because you're helping a lot. I mean, it's not just about yourself, but really, it's about empowering others. And you even mentioned earlier about uh, like women startup uh, owned type of organization and believe it or not i i worked with you know few clients where they're women owned and mm -hmm. to you know uh, to, to be upfront I, I it's a very different world like you know for for a male dominated type of uh you know company or organization there's a lot of you know healthy competition going on right so you know it's it's all about trying to achieve greater heights but, you know, when I had an experience working with women-owned um, organizations, it's, it's, it's really different uh, perspective altogether. So I was like, I, maybe we can touch point on that. And mm -hmm. you mentioned there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, startups right now. Um, I, I'm currently in front of a website uh, that says there's around 700 uh, startups in Philippines, So, mm -hmm. which is becoming very promising um mm -hmm. and you know maybe you can share a few uh few insights from your own experience uh working with these types of startups as well as you know the the diversity uh associated with it yeah um 700 yes are that's supposed to be the number we have in the philippines but uh i think it's never enough it's not enough uh compared to say other so I'm looking at the business density or the com uh, how many companies 
mm-hmm. versus one uh one thousand people. So um, let's just look at the three three countries: uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, because that's where we're always compared. Uh, that's the comparison today. <laughs> um, and in Viet in Vietnam, there are two point uh, there are yeah two point nine businesses per 1,000, let me see, yeah, per 1,000 people. Mm-hmm. And then I think in in the, in the Indonesia, it, it, let me get back. So, so we have a point something, it's, it's, it's much lower than, than, mm-hmm. so it's something like in Indonesia, it's one. And then in the Philippines, it's like, like 0.9. But let me check okay. my data. <laughs> sure, sure. I think, uh, and sorry, uh, I, I need to correct myself. I think this statistics is for the 2022 only uh, for the DTI. So there's like uh, seven, 700, okay. 700 startups that got registered, I think, in DTI. So Oh, cool. okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, in terms of business density, uh, if you compare the three countries, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, Mm -hmm. we have the lowest density. So we don't have enough uh, businesses per uh, per 1,000 people. So we need to really grow the number of entrepreneurs because um, I think that entrepreneurship is not only for the sake of growing your economy um, mm-hmm. and and make strengthening the economy but i think it's also a means of strengthening our people and preparing them for the 21st century right. i think there's no other no other course or no the, I, I was speaking to someone earlier she has this entrepreneurship course and uh mm-hmm. It's used in different parts of the world, and uh, she agrees that that um, there's no other way for people to learn the 21st century skills faster, better mm-hmm. than being part of a company or being doing a startup. So even if your startup fails, it yeah. you are not a failure. There, I, I don't believe there's really a total failure. Um, I it's I don't think there's failure. Failure. I think. The, the proper term is lessons learned yes. because in, in the course of stumbling and others call it failure, you learn a lot about yourself. So um, it is entrepreneurship is a very good way to learn who you are, to get to understand where your flaws are, to understand where your strengths are. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's a very good way for self-development. People look at maybe it's a shameful thing to have a business that doesn't work. I yes. I don't think so. <laughs> I, yeah. I so I so let's just start with on idea space. So I start I started with idea space in 2012. And in 2013, we had uh, 10 startups. Out of the 10 startups uh, today, I think only two are existing, or three are existing. So maybe seven out of 10 failed. But mm-hmm. out of those seven teams that so called failed, none of them are unsuccessful today. So, yeah. so you you stumble and then you pick yourself up again. Because if you ask all these successful entrepreneurs anyway, they have failure stories too. They yeah. they want to say, okay, so you want to hear my um my success? Stories? Uh, it will just take you two minutes. But if you want to hear my failure stories, do you have two days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, like, they, the the yeah. thing is, people who are successful are actually people who know how to pick themselves up after a failure. And that's how life is. Life is 
yes, man, life is up and down. So people just celebrate all the good things. But the, the reality is we all go through this peaks and valleys. And some people, valleys, valleys, valleys. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. but, um, but those who don't give up have become really better versions of themselves. And when they achieve a certain that level of success they know how to pick others up as well the the true entrepreneurs the successful people they will never say that i got here because of myself i love it Uh, there are some who like say ah yeah i but if you just look at things or study it longitudinally this person let's say Maybe two or three years ago, someone celebrated himself so much. And you ask yourself today, is that person still where he is at? Mm, Chances are no, because if you're just so self-promoting, you'll, you'll, you'll suffer. (laughs) You'll, you'll swim in your own, I don't know, in your ego at some point. Yeah. things will come crumbling down for you so yeah i think uh, the successful entrepreneurs who are able to pick themselves up that's our big challenge as a country so um i think in 2017 uh, idea space commissioned a study 80 percent of the entrepreneurs who did not who failed i don't like really that term but yeah they can consider it failed did not want to do a startup again. Oh, okay. That's a sad thing about many Filipinos who go into business. They are afraid to start it. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you look at it, okay, if they didn't do a startup, they probably went into corporate. And I also see a lot, I can tell you, a lot of success stories of startups who failed and then decided to go into corporate they moved faster than their, you know, go went up the corporate ladder much faster than be their peers or people same age as them, because there's no other no other experience that makes you carry everything. <laughs> yes. Do a startup, right? So I I think that parents should encourage their children to do business. Oh, what could John Anak? You're going to lose so much money. Uh, parents are just looking and dreaming that their children will make money on the first try. Um, yeah. I think parents should encourage, okay, failure early on, even if it costs money. But then if parents see it as an investment in the child's personality development, if you can just reframe and look at it that way. Yeah. And if you're there for your son or your daughter when the failure happens, or if you're there to help them through and process what happened and what caused it, it it will be much less than probably sending your son or daughter to MBA and probably Mm -hmm. more impactful. Yeah. I think the parents are entrepreneurs. They see that and they encourage their kids to do business and and uh, yeah, are okay with a failure. Yeah, and I'm that's, rambling that's, on. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, hundred percent. I agree. Like, uh, you know, kids back then, where uh, whenever they fail, uh, it's almost equivalent to like a punishment uh so i think that's the reason why you know a lot are um they have this fear of trying out new things um and instead you know they uh or we uh i'm guilty uh we end up uh, doing the conventional way but you know uh it's never too late i i do believe that you know um despite uh regardless the age as long as you have an idea you believe uh could uh, put a dent to the universe (laughs) you know by all means uh, go after it and uh, that's what that's why I actually am trying to do this podcast here is you know to 
because I do believe that, you know, empowering and help, helping others as well as, you know, trying to promote, uh, you know, a community of shared wins will eventually help the country and also the insights uh, that we will be able to gather here uh, mm -hmm. is something that could spark innovation. So I was telling, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the guests that I talked to, you know, I, I just talked to someone that said La Union is very beautiful, but they're having power outages. So mm -hmm. if the local government, you know, hears that, you know, the podcast episode, <laughs> hopefully you know, they'll they'll take action and, you know, uh, you know, improve uh, infrastructure as well as maybe explore mm -hmm. sustainability or uh, you know other uh, environmental solutions like solar or or hydro or whatever mm -hmm. so things like that um, there's a lot of things that we can do and even you mentioned about the DTI uh, grant uh, organization uh, there are some initiatives I saw around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have a lot of talent here, I do believe. Uh, I've worked with, you know, uh, very highly talented uh, data ninja, call them data ninja because, you know, they can create pivot tables, they can, they can create, <laughs> you know, they can mm -hmm. gen generate competitive intelligence. They're, they're pretty amazing. So, you know, it's, it's all about, um, I think, uh, empowering the people as well as helping with maybe financial or seed run, uh, funding or, or angel investment and then trying to flip the mindset altogether instead of, you know, investing in e album or whatever, <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. Why not try to invest to, you know, something tangible, maybe real estate or uh, convert the real estate to, you know, uh, you know, something that would generate income and also job opportunities for, mm -hmm. for a lot of people. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we talked about the idea space and also maybe the, the grant, uh, uh, the DTI. Uh, so were there a few, uh, like, uh, instances or maybe, uh, I don't know, deals or cases where, you know, it was very challenging for, for you guys to work with, but eventually it became a success story. Like, you know, the, the company grew and, you know, it exploded or yeah. something. Yeah. So we talked about endurance earlier and um, what comes to mind are the ed tech startups. So oh, okay. many years ago, these ed tech startups, whether it's e-learning or mm -hmm. it's, um, it's digitizing um, processes in the schools and universities. It was very hard for these startups to find universities or or schools to mm -hmm. want to digitize. So, um, but the ch the good thing about these companies are these founders is they didn't give up so just if up uh, before the pandemic mm -hmm. i think they would not be in a very good position today so, I I, so if you think of a, what was difficult before um ed tech was very difficult because they couldn't have they couldn't articulate uh a successful business model or business model that worked because it varied so much from school to school and then there it was so difficult to automate a lot of things it was so difficult to get teachers to use um, online learning uh, and to do blended learning um, mm -hmm. our paradigms were just so uh, no, it has to be classroom and online was just all supplemental. But mm. hello, the pandemic happened. Yeah. <laughs> then boom, and, like pandemic. And we have to still get the kids into school, right? So right. Um, I think the ed tech startups were in a very good position. Whoever was, was still surviving at the startup when the pandemic struck are today making 
millions of dollars revenue. Oh, wow. Millions. That's awesome. Yeah. And and I, I don't want to name names because, oh my gosh, uh, baka they'll get <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> They're saying, don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine Let, let's let's but let's leave good the mystery payers. to i know <laughs> to these the guys listeners. are good taxpayers <laughs> oh that's great that's great to hear but, you know their their friends in elementary might be calling on them and say oh you're making so oh, much money in a plan but yes uh if you think of a if a i think it's the ed tech startups that come into my mind um next are the the companies that worked on efficiency, uh, mm-hmm. productivity, they're the ones who um, are are doing very well. I mean, who I know personally are doing very well. But uh, working on productivity, um, uh, business efficiency, I think is not as complicated as working with schools. It's cool. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. yeah. um, like, say, if you're working on, like, say, large companies or, or let's say, a certain type of business and you want to automate, parang you can, the, the, there are a lot of, after a certain, a few companies, parang there's a trend already. But then for schools, it mm-hmm. wasn't the case. For totally them. green field. Um, no. It's very, very different. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, like how you would sell to some companies. There may be just a few tweaks, but for schools, how you would sell is different. So some schools, the decision maker is the librarian, or some schools, right. the decision maker is the school administrator. The other one is the business owner, or the other one is like procurement mm-hmm. or something. So there is no one person in in uh, the education system that makes the decision. Yeah, versus in a company, uh, it's generally the purchasing and then the owner and then maybe operations. Uh, so, so parang mas na siya for certain areas when it comes to like, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, tracking your people, it will probably right. be, you will approach HR and then operations. Ganon. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Or... Um, if you're selling a uh, product, it will be probably uh, purchasing and the technical person, something like that. No, mm-hmm. but in schools, it was totally different. You say you'd have it's two totally two schools. You'd have two schools. Let's say they're both kindergarten, and they, they kind of have the same profile, mm-hmm. but it, it's you know they, they had that's that's a challenge with. Uh, many of the ed tech startups. So so if there was something complicated to me, what comes to mind are the ed tech startups. So after the pandemic, because of great timing, they are now success stories. Wow, that's that's great. <laughs> Thanks, and, Thanks and, for the great can, timing. <laughs> yeah. I mean the talk about like, you know, uh diamond in the rough kind of a success story. Like before uh we don't even think about e-learning we don't even in the u.s i think uh, you know it's it's not a a hot and sexy topic or uh, like a solution right it's more of like business productivity tools it's about you know databases it's about cybersecurity. They, they don't even talk about e-learning but but now they're like the king of the <laughs> king of the industry and even like collaboration tools like zoom and all you know before mm-hmm. we don't even try to use that, but uh, it it became like a a day to day type of um, a tool uh, for people mm-hmm. to use. Can can I ask a sub question on, on that topic, uh, mm-hmm. Diane? By the way, since you talked about really the potential of this um, of the entrepreneurship, the type of revenue or even the profit that you can generate in the future did you also experience some like uh, mergers and acquisitions in philippines like for example uh it's a a filipino or a filipino grown uh software that got acquired by maybe a a multinational company that'll be another (laughs) that'll be another gold mine 
Yeah, I uh, when I was in Idea Space, coins got acquired by uh, oh, okay. <laughs> what's the Indonesian company? Oh my goodness, my memory. Um, so anyway, um, yes, they got acquired. So it it's nice. It feels good to see. But then it's not really a Filipino who started coins. It, there's mm -hmm. a Philippine team, but it, it's it probably got acquired because the founder had experience in growing startups as well as um, um, getting, you know, working on an exit. So um, hopefully, that's why I was saying it's a numbers game. 700 is not enough because mm -hmm. out of the 700, how many of those companies would get acquired by a larger company? And so, yeah. um, and why I'm also advocating a lot on business integrity because it starts from there. You have to really have a good foundation on transparency and, uh, um, uh, you know, um, putting the, the house in order because mm -hmm. people won't invest in you or they won't. They won't buy your company if your risks are too high. If if you have too many risks, um, so the uh, I think business integrity is very important. It's like a how mm -hmm. foundation where it's a tone from the top where you 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 as a business owner you set the tone and then you have four walls. The mm -hmm. first wall is um, the first wall would be to. Um, to, to training and communication. Right. And then your second wall is due diligence. You you will choose the people that you you bring into the company, proper selection, proper selection of suppliers and also customers. Mm -hmm. And then the third component was you'd, you'd have to have policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. So that's your third wall. And your fourth wall would be you have to do a risk assessment. So where do you think um, things can break down? So you have to mitigate those risks. And then um, at the top is a roof, right, of your house. So your roof right. is monitoring, verification, testing. So never ending. That is something you need to constantly do, monitoring and seeing if where things are breaking down. And ensuring if uh, your foundation, the tone that you had set from the top, is um, is um, is uh, understood by people. Uh, if it's not understood, then are you doing training? Again, one of the the walls that that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, I I really think it's important for. Filipino companies to, to pay attention to mm -hmm. business integrity if they want to eventually get funding from mm -hmm. uh, another person or another entity or like an investor or mm -hmm. if they eventually want to sell their company to someone uh, mm -hmm. it should be founded on integrity because um yeah, as I said earlier, who would want to buy a company that has so many risks? <laughs> so many loopholes and all. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree. And to our listeners, I am also learning right now. I'm jotting down some notes. So, you know, uh, it's really about uh, making sure that from the get-go, you know, you, uh, there's integrity and then, uh, you know, you do all the necessary yeah, legal stuff and mm -hmm. all. <laughs> so, but it's not easy, you know, Joseph. Um, yes. When you tell people, okay, business integrity, you're talking about bribery, you're talking about, you know, gender, you know, diversity and inclusion, stuff like mm -hmm. that. When it's there, glaring at your eye, in front of you, it's not easy. It's not mm -hmm. easy when you you know you have to give a nice gift to someone <laughs> just yeah. so the contract can get signed. So <laughs> yeah. it, it isn't easy as a business owner. Um, 
sometimes you cannot just be purely black, black and white. Like say you 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 say there shouldn't be sexual harassment in your company. You don't do it, but then you hired someone and you he seemed to be okay, and then or yeah. she seemed to be okay, and then you hear a story about one night your employees went out to the pub and they get yeah. drinking, and somebody was a bit more aggressive, and then boom, you have a sexual harassment uh, case in your company. Oh my God. <laughs> like, what do you do, right? <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, your hair is falling out. and <laughs> here, here you are. You need to, you know, talk, think about your customer. You have to think about um, cash flow. You know, you have to think about sueldo. Yes. And then here's your employee coming in and with sexual harassment case. Oh, my goodness. It's really not oh easy. So it's, it's, yeah. it's for the brave. And so, again, so entrepreneurship is a way to help us become braver entrepreneurship is a way for us to get to know who we are um, better to become better citizens i think uh, it, it's it's i think it's a wonderful avenue to to do so many great things and to become a better version of yourself i'm kind of biased as you can see <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, a hundred percent, I agree to everything. And <laughs> it's, it's really about uh, trying to craft the, uh, you know, your ideal environment from the get go. So it's, it's also involves a lot of hard work in terms of hiring the right people, vetting out the false positives and all, mm -hmm. and then, you know, trying to make sure that uh, the team members will not just uh, work hard, but also stay longer, right? You know, the loyalty right, is right. a big part. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, uh, it, it's really hard work. And this is really about, you said to fail podcast, it's about candid exploration of, you know, uh, what are the birth pains of starting up? Uh, but, you know, since you have the benefit of, uh, listening early on some of these challenges, you mm -hmm. know, you, you can, right? And, or, uh, you know, yes. anticipate yes. it. You and can. You can. And I think the most important thing to, to avoid failure is know yourself. Yeah. Self-awareness, I think, is key to it. If you know who you are, you know your strength, you know your weakness, and you know what you really can't just, you know, people say, I oh, just get training on this. Yeah, it's just not your strength. It's just not your intelligence. That's just not your superpower. Why force yourself to do something? It's not your superpower. So get someone else whose superpower comes in and, and you can partner with that person. And then if you want to partner with that person, okay, can you afford the salary for this person? If you can't afford a salary, what do you do? I guess you give a part of your company you use to shares or maybe you can have some mm -hmm. profit sharing or you have to. So it starts from there, knowing yourself. And then when you know yourself, what kind of selection will you do for the others who want to come into your company? If you know yourself that you're a king thinker rather than a rich thinker. So a king thinker is you want to own 100% of a 10 million peso company. But if you're mm -hmm. a rich thinker, you're okay with owning 10% of a 100 million peso company. Right. So, um, if you know who you are, you don't like to take orders from someone, then most likely you're a king thinker. Somebody says, is that good or bad? It's not bad. It's knowing who you are. And right. if you say you, you don't like getting orders from someone else by all means just do it all your own diba? just right. own the company on your own pero yun nga um, you will know that siguro pag ganyan may mga blind spots ka so who's yeah. gonna come in and help you and say knock knock oops you're you're yeah. not you, you, you have to have somebody who's your your chancha there telling you oh okay you're yeah. a bit uh, biased here and so you have to know 
and you need to put in mechanisms to help you uh, see your, you know, help you avoid the blind spots. So I think uh, at the very core is an entrepreneur who's self-aware. The other one is an, an entrepreneur who's kind of, it needs a certain level of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, like, I, I think I, for me, I'm not really the, the more, the ideal entrepreneur. <laughs> I can, I'm just a good observer of entrepreneurs and I'm a good enabler for entrepreneurs, but oh, I'm not true. the entrepreneur myself because I, I just not smart enough as the others. So the others are really, when the, the entrepreneurs I know, just, just intelligent. They can pick up signals and process signals. They are able to have, you know, when you're, you know, this person in school that you had like can handle all these algebraic uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, equations or who can do this, uh, uh, derivation and chemistry, all those. So, so usually people like that who, who able to stretch their brain, um, they 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 have. I think what it it's, it takes to be a good entrepreneur. You, you have to be. I know. You you have to have a certain level of intelligence. Oh, great! That lovely. Yeah. I, I I love that. And yeah. it's, actually, it's really I three five qualities yeah, that I think are good entrepreneurs so the third is commitment you've got to have commitment so hindi pwedeng ano to it's like a short time you like for two years and see if it works mm -hmm. but sometimes two years is not enough diba? yeah yeah it took zuckerberg what seven years before you can really say facebook years. is uh, facebook what it is diba? so yeah um and then um there is certain level of prudence and honesty yeah. you have to be there has to be there has to be good stewardship um, it, even if it's like say it's your own company stewardship to your people stewardship of you know you you have to respect your people's time so and then the lastly is really acknowledging how others have brought you to where you are so um, you'll never do it. Get to do it alone. So even if you're a king thinker, um, there will always be people who help you, connect you to someone, uh, provide, give you a client, give you a lead to a client. So it's never yours. It's never about yourself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. even even if you're a king thinker, eventually you know a client. Will, <laughs> will you will need to serve your clients, and then also, uh, you know, it's 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 really yeah. about service. Like, oh, oh. who will buy your product if you're just thinking of yourself, Diva? Right? Yeah. First of all, <laughs> when you develop a product, it must be about them. It's not about you. So I've seen yeah. so many startups fail because they thought of a great idea instead of like understand first what the problem of the person and then build a product from that problem. So that, that's another flaw we have. As a, it's not only in the Philippines, but a lot of entrepreneurs all over mm -hmm. the world is that they, they don't design for humans. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they, they design for a human, but then you know, with this the, the concept of design thinking is you design with the person in the customer in mind. It's not right. yourself. You know? How how would people benefit using that particular yeah. technology yeah. or you know even a service? Right. So yeah. how would we save tremendous amount of time? Uh, mm -hmm. so things mm -hmm. like that uh, yeah yeah customer discovery I, I i'm a great advocate of customer discovery that's a hat i wear every now and then i spend time with um, university researchers um doing customer discovery it's so much fun it's it's oh, really a lot of fun and you put, force them to to do interviews talk to people oh, that's not that's nice <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's really it's beautiful to see how their ideas transform and um, how their concepts pivot because they realize okay after talking to several people not their aunts not their uncles or their wife or husband <laughs> but talk to people who um who encounter the problem that they they want to solve and uh, you'll discover a lot and and yep. that's even written a single line of code you haven't even spent a single peso to develop a product it's all just first talking to the customer yeah. so absolutely uh, that's another and, topic in itself <laughs> yeah or, or i mean if you have time uh, we maybe we can craft a second episode uh, okay. where we talk All about right. we talk about those <laughs> things, but you know before you know uh, before we wrap this up, uh, Diane, I have another question if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, since you're you're pretty exposed um, in government initiatives as well, I assume. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what are the things that the government is doubling down in terms of uh, you know initiatives? Uh, so, is it uh, is it Connectivity, internet connectivity, cybersecurity, uh, data centers, uh, or uh, network uh, infrastructure, or machine learning, artificial intelligence. What What are the areas? Maybe it can spark some interests uh, to our listeners. Maybe they have some awesome ideas that uh, mm -hmm. you know. This This is like their their sign <laughs> to to start doing what yeah. they what they want. Well, I don't want to go down the direction of uh, capital focusing on uh, like uh, how much money to spend on infrastructure and connectivity and things like that because I'm not the ex I'm not an expert there. Um, I'm also not an expert really in in what I'm about to say is that we need to focus on human, I mean capital. The human capital, our capacity mm -hmm. development, and um, I think that uh, the government agencies. Let's I just let's just say let's within the Innovative Startup Act, mm -hmm. uh, mandated by the Innovative Startup Act. I think they're they're doing quite a lot. So as I said earlier, I do a lot of work with DOSD, Department of Science and Technology. I also see a lot of effort in the DICT, uh, Department of Information, Communication <laughs> Technology, and also DTI, so Department of Trade and Industry. So I see these three agencies working on capacity development. Um, mm -hmm. The biggest asset of a country is its people, right? So we must invest in people. More than you invest in a startup, you have to invest in people. Don't just look at the business model. Don't just look at the idea. We must look at the people. And um, and government is has been bold enough to, to, to take on the adventure capital side of it. So before the venture capitalists come in, before the angel investors come in, I think that these three agencies, especially for me, I can really vouch for DOSD. They have, uh, they have uh, been investing a lot in the capacity development or developing people and then tracking and seeing where they're needs to be more stimulus so they they're doing things even before the innovative startup act they already started to kind of prototype and experiment on uh, funding startups within the realm of research because every startup is early stage i mean a lot of startups are early stage and they do they need research so uh dosd put some money in that and then finally when the innovative startup act uh, the law uh, they were able to expand and uh, fortunately you know they they started with a few uh tens of millions now it's in the hundred of millions that they mm -hmm. they have to deploy to start up um they started off with really like kind of pure science but now they're already exploring into communities into like um uh doing social enterprises or women-led mm -hmm. Uh, enterprises. So I don't know of 
any government agency that deploys as much money as DOSD for women helping women funds <laughs> or wow. women helping communities or social enterprises. So I think uh, uh, DOSD is, uh, I think, um, at the forefront of, of, of supporting startups. Uh, maybe second in line. Eh? I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to compare maybe too much, but I, I'm more exposed to Kasi Siguro for DOSD, so I can vouch for that. I see. So I think Great. if there is a technical area, the frontier technologies need uh, need support. So cybersecurity, my, mm -hmm. machine learning, AI, things like that. We need to, to have a lot more capacity building there. Mm -hmm. I also think that we should put a lot of effort also on climbing. Um, yes. We, we, we're part of the vulnerable countries. Yeah. And uh, we should focus on a lot on on understanding our climate so we can you know uh, put some adaptation or at least mitigation uh, mm -hmm. work on more mitigation measures so there's a lot to it's a lot yeah yeah absolutely and uh to our listeners if you know you have some ideas uh and then you're struggling to uh execute maybe you know you can try reaching out to the ost um, in order for uh, maybe, you know, get some qualifications um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, uh, you'll, yeah, you'll never I know unless we try. That's that's really the whole point. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, so DOSD is funding um, university incubators. So I think and, and these university incubators are also supposed to take in startups, not only from the university, but externally. So um, mm -hmm. They, I think that if you have an idea and you want to test it, I think you can knock on the doors of universities to, to help incubate, incubate you and, and grow your business and test it out. Awesome, that that's great. I believe there's a lot of value uh, that you know uh, this can bring to the table, especially uh, inspiring, you know, uh, upcoming and as a spot. Uh, entrepreneurs and then also uh help you know mindset help mental health uh because you know we've we've just uh <laughs> came out of a pandemic mm -hmm. so you know it's it's trying to really help a lot of our people uh do the next step level up um so mm -hmm. where can they you know reach out uh at the end is it to you directly or is it a, there's a website that uh they can check out. Just go to my LinkedIn. I uh, I respond to most messages on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. just, just don't sell me insurance or real estate. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I'm 55. So I don't think I'm very good insurance customer anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, just so LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Facebook. Are you on Facebook? Ah, well? uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is still more my LinkedIn. Best. Uh, yeah, I, Facebook is only for people I have met face to face. Okay. Okay. Got yeah. it. So, and then to our listeners, uh, we'll include links to the description, so you can easily check it out, inquire, and then uh, also if if you have any comments, uh, suggestions, or uh, any topics mind that you want to put to the show, maybe you know we can <laughs> we can earn the time of Diane again for a second episode. So this is Diane. This is a very fun uh, session, and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, genuinely, I'm, I'm not even trying to uh, <laughs> exaggerate. It's it's really about uh, 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 you know, for me, it's about just going. Uh, starting the business and then uh, taking risks and then eventually it'll pay off in, in the future. Yeah. So I appreciate uh, all the motivations that you provided today. Yeah, just go for it, guys. Uh, just dive. If it's an itch, go scratch that itch. <laughs> Do it. Don't worry about failure. 
Embrace awesome. it. Embrace the failure. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. This is Joseph. You're listening to Set to Fail podcast. Have a great day. And there you have it. We hope you enjoyed and learned a lot in this episode. And if you did, please subscribe to YouTube, hit the notification bell, leave us a comment, also reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcast. This would really help the show to continue creating more and more insightful content for us to learn together. Thank you very much. Have a great day.